Welcome to 2019. Um, it is, of course, if, if you think in the context of this, it is the last year of the decade. Do you think like that? No? It's the last year of the decade. And we will not be, and we will be going, what will we be doing? 2020. Who would have ever imagined it, hey? Uh, well, it's not here yet. We've got much to do before that happens. Um, so we want to start this year in Ephesians this morning. We want to start and uh, we want to begin uh, and look at the armour of God over the next few weeks. And uh, um, before we begin our next book study, and I think it's a, a great place to start any year. It's a great place to start any time uh, to know that we have not been abandoned, to know that the Lord has not left us and uh, we don't have to def depend upon our own devices, but rather God has a way for us to be able to stand. And not only stand, but to stand victoriously as the children of God in this world. Um, read these verses with me, will you? Um, are you in chapter 6 of Ephesians? <clears throat> Could I bother someone for a drink? Would they mind? Um... Thank you, Jim. <clears throat> so he begins in this passage in verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armour of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armour of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith which you ha will be, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Um, I think we will this morning travel as far as, well... Verse 10 and half of verse 11. Um, just to get us going, just to introduce us to this subject. Um, notice where the passage begins. Thank you, Jim. Notice where the passage begins. We're talking about war, aren't we? We're talking about warfare. Spiritual warfare. And notice where the passage on warfare begins. It begins with this word, finally, there in the 10th word. And I believe that word finally is in light of, of everything that has been re revealed throughout the book of Ephesians. See, you just can't pick up this passage, you know, and I really do you a dis discredit, but not a discredit, but I really don't do you any favours by bringing you and starting you here in the sixth chapter. Because the reality is, to understand spiritual warfare, you really need to start at the beginning in verse 1, chapter 1 of this book of Ephesians. And I believe um, it is laid out for us, this, this plan for the child of God, revealed throughout the whole book, as I say, to prepare us to be soldiers that stand, to be, to be spiritual soldiers clad in the armour of God who know the victory that Christ has, and that's an important thing, Christ has won for us. So I would encourage you, read through Ephesians over the next few weeks. We're going to keep coming back to chapter 6, but I want you to read through the entire book if you can. Understand the richness, because it truly is an incredible laying out of the richness of our salvation and the life that God has called us to, that he has called the blood-washed child of God, the blood-brought child of God to experience the richness of that life. You know, it's just really quickly, you come to chapter 1, and in chapter 1, he starts off speaking of how God, according to his sovereign grace, has chosen us. 
Let me just read verse 4 of chapter 1 to you, where it says, He chose us in Him. I'm going to be fast, so if you can keep up with me, go for it. But He has chosen us in the foundation, before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love having predestined us to the adoption of sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. He said, we have been sealed in, in verse 13 of that chapter. We have been sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. And then you come into the second chapter. We're reminded of the state that God found us or the state from which God brought life to us. We were in spiritual death and he made us alive, it says in the second chapter. Can I read this to you? I love this passage in the second chapter, starting verse 1, where he says, And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sin, in which you once walked according to the course of this world. Please note these things. Where you once walked according to the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of our flesh and of the mind, and were by nature, he says, the children of wrath, as are others, were by nature children of wrath. But God in his rich mercy, Paul says, God in his rich mercy because of his great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in trespasses has made us alive together in Christ for by grace we have been saved and he's raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places. What a great promise that is. Yeah, true, we are sitting in this building. Yeah, true, we are sitting on these maybe not so comfortable chairs right now. But as far as God is concerned, where are you, child of God? It's a done deal, isn't it? As far as God is concerned, you are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He will say, we who were once afar off from the spiritual life have been quickened. We have made alive in Jesus Christ unto eternal life. He will say that we have been made members of the household of God, where in Christ all nations, all cultures, all creeds, all colours have been brought together where peace and unity can exist. That's what he's done for us. The richness of this finished work. And then we come into chapter 4 and he begins to speak about the spiritual gifts that is given to the church. He says that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love that we may grow in all things unto him who is the head that is Christ Jesus. Isn't that rich? Isn't that glorious? And we come to the fifth chapter and he says that we should walk in love. As God has loved us. And then we enter into that wonderful exhortation where he begins to talk about the the filling of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit-filled life. Where he begins to talk about how he reveals to us what that life looks like. He's revealed to us what we should look like as husbands. What we should look like as, as, as wives, as parents, as children. What, the, what, what it looks like to be a spirit-guided, filled person in this world. <clears throat> and the whole book, the whole book is just filled with the richness of the heavenly blessings and the great calling that he has placed upon our lives and how we are to day by day Walk in this reality. So go back and read it. Chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And into chapter 6. And then come to this 10th verse where he then says, finally. Think about that. He's exalted us. He's lifted us up into this most high place. This most incredible calling upon our life. And then he says, finally, There is war. There is war. He wants us to know, you see, after having said all of this, he wants us to know that there is an enemy. 
And you and I need to know there is a spiritual enemy. People are just going to laugh it off, I know, but I know there's an enemy, don't you? There is a spiritual enemy. He wants us to know the richness of that Christian life that he has promised you. He wants you and I to know, Christian, that it will not go unchallenged. We've got to know that. God tells us we were chosen again. God tells us we were sealed with, the, with the, the spirit of promise, giving us the guarantee of that finished work. Again, he tells us we're seated in heavenly places. But what is the devil doing? You know that truth, don't you? But what is the devil doing? He's constantly undermining. He's constantly chiseling away at that security, constantly undermining the full assurance that he wants us to have in this life as we follow him. The scripture tells us we've been placed here, that we have purpose in the body of Christ. He tells us that there are works for you and I to be engaging in that God has preordained for you to be a part of the living, growing body of Christ, preordained works for us to walk in. But what is the enemy doing? The enemy is constantly there trying to separate us from the body of Christ. He's constantly there wanting us to doubt God's enabling upon our lives. He, he wants you to be isolated. He wants you to be critical of the body of Christ. You know, and too many of us are, isn't that right? Too many of us, of us have these critical eyes and are constantly pulling down brothers and sisters in Christ. That's not the work of the Holy Spirit. No, 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 no. There's an enemy. And Christ wants you to have the richness of the Spirit-filled life. He wants it in your marriage. He wants your marriage to reflect the love that God has for his church. He wants it to speak to this world. But again, what is the devil doing? He is relentless, isn't he? He's relentless in his attack against the sanctity of the, of the marriage relationship. He's relentless in his attack of godly morality within the home. And so the scripture says two things when it opens up with this, finally, brethren, Finally, one is there will be battle. And that is because, and you know this, that is because when you said yes to Jesus Christ, war was declared on you. you know that war was declared on you. Again, your spirit, we've read it already, but your spirit was made alive when you came to Christ. The part of you that was dead in trespasses and sins was given and now was, was, was given life and now you begin to communicate with the God of heaven. But the God of this world doesn't like that. The, the God of this world with whom you were previously aligning yourselves according to lusts and desires. We've read it just now, didn't we, in that second chapter. That God has become your enemy. And now there's battle. And he doesn't want you to know the richness of that, of that relationship. He doesn't want you to have that. And so now there is a struggle for the things of the Spirit. And if you've been a Christian for more than 30 seconds trying to follow Jesus Christ, trying to lay your down upon that altar, then you know what I'm talking about. So that's number one. But secondly, and I think just as, if not more importantly... Those spiritual blessings, all of that fruitfulness of the spirit-filled life that has been spoken about, all of it can, no, let me say should be, realized in my, in your life. It should be, despite the fact that we have an enemy. Why? Because our strength, and this is what we will discover as we go through this, our strength is not of us. Certainly is not of us, but it's of the Lord who has done what to the devil? 
It's a D word. It's a very important D word. He has defeated the devil. Isn't that right? So he says, finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. But the reality is this, and I've got to say this. The reality is that there are so many believers that live their Christian life as if they have not been made alive in the Spirit. You know, Paul says in chapter 4, verse 23 of this book, that we are renewed in the spirit of our mind. And that is that we have heard and we have learnt Christ. And so that through the act of walking in righteousness, he then begins the fifth chapter by saying we become imitators of God. Paul calls it putting on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Christian, if you live the life that is honouring God, if you put away unrighteousness as we have been called to do so, if you, as he says in chapter 4, give no place to the devil in your conduct, and you will know there's a battle. You will know there's a battle. You see, we're not, and, and, and I think, um, I don't know how to say this, but we are not simply saved to sit around and wait for these blessings that we've just spoken of and read about. We're not simply saved to sit around and wait for the blessings of God to simply just rain down upon us. No, no, no. We have aligned ourselves with the God of love and truth and righteousness. And that's how we live. We live by love, truth and righteousness. And there will be a fight over those things. If you follow Jesus Christ, you will find that you have entered into a battlefield. Every single one of you. Now, before we go on, and I says, I'm, this is just an introduction this morning. We're not going to get very far into this at all. But before we go on, I need to point out there are positions that people take when it comes to this subject on warfare that I think we need to guard ourselves against. Very much so. The first one is a position of scepticism. And that is that there are people out there that simply say, devil, are you crazy? Do you believe in that medieval whatever? Are you crazy? And the scepticism is scepticism basically about all that is supernatural. And the supernatural is mostly dismissed in people's minds, especially when it comes to the reality of Satan. And believers have no interest in the spiritual realm. In fact, they become very indifferent to it. And what you discover in these sort of people, when there is an indifference to the spiritual realm, when there is an indifference to the reality and the existence of an enemy who is warring against us, most people then become very materialistic in their position as a Christian. And they focus on the material rather than the spiritual and there is no balance. And you see it everywhere, don't you? You see it everywhere in the church. So we need to guard against that. Satan's real. He is there. And he has his schemes, his stratagems. And we're going to look at those over the next few weeks. Paul refers to them as the wiles of the devil. He says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We shouldn't be fighting with one another. We shouldn't be arguing. We should know who the true enemy really is. You know? The devil there wants to pull our marriages apart. He wants to destroy the Christian home. He wants to have a sign that says to this world, see, this Jesus thing doesn't work. But Jesus says, no. My marriage covenant is all about my love. It's all about the light that I want to shine upon the face of humanity. That the world can see, you see. We've got to understand these things. Yeah, there's a devil there. There really is. But the other position that we need to guard against is the opposite of that. And that is the extreme where everything, and I mean everything, is about demons and devils and warlocks and witches, you know. 
And there's all these ideas that, 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 that come out. People start adding and they start inventing ideas that have no scriptural grounding whatsoever. You'll start hearing things about, about um, spiritual mapping and things like, like that where, that where they will come into a community and they will map out the spiritual ground and they will divide it up into, into, um, into territories. They'll talk of territorial spirits and they'll start categorising demons and they'll, and they'll start giving them names and there will be different levels of attack. There will be the ground level, there will be the occult level, there will be the strategic level and there's all this stuff going on and it's way, way, way too much from the movie. There's no grounding in the Bible whatsoever. You know what happens there? People become so consumed with the activity of Satan that they lose focus on Jesus and his gospel. Why he actually came, you know? And for the most part, that extreme, you know what it creates? It creates fear in the heart of God's people. And confusion in the minds of God's people. You know, you know what I think? I, I think Satan would be happy for us to fall in either camp. You know? Because I don't think we're really bothering him. I really don't. Paul here. You see, there's, there's none of that in what Paul says. Paul is here is wanting us to bring to us a balanced view of the spiritual realm. And yeah, he wants us and we need to take it very, very seriously. Because if that is a reality, the devil does exist and he hates you. He hates everything you do in Christ. That's a reality. Then how do I stand? You know, how do I stand? Well, can I say the devil doesn't want you to stand? Can I say he wants to take you out of the battle altogether? He knows he cannot touch your salvation. It's a gift of God. He cannot touch your eternal security. He knows that. But he can certainly, most certainly make you ineffectual in the kingdom of God. Or he can make you a complete distraction that is just leading people down crazy paths that really accomplishes nothing and brings no one to a saving grace. You know. Well, I believe Paul is bringing that balance. He's bringing that balance. And this plan that he, we would say here begins with this word, finally, is contained in the whole book. So that's all I want to say today. You know, Ephesians begins again. Please read it. I know I've asked you already, but please read it in the next few weeks. Paul begins by teaching us what God has done for us through Christ. And then he tells us how to walk in light of what Jesus Christ has done for us. We sit in heavenly places. Paul, in speaking about the redeeming work of Christ upon the cross in the book of Colossians, says that he has disarmed principalities and powers. It says that he has made a public spectacle of them. He says, triumphing over them. That is upon the cross. Jesus himself would say in Matthew chapter 28 and verse, um, verse 15. No, 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 no. Yes, verse 19. Check me out. Correct me, please. That he has been given all, all authority in heaven and earth, right? See, that's why the Apostle Paul in Romans 8, that most favourite of chapters, is opened up by saying, and he says it there victoriously, doesn't he? It's a great declaration. I can just see the Apostle Paul writing his way through or, or, or dictating his way through chapter 7, that great struggle, that great struggle over and over again, but then Captain coming to the 8th chapter and finally just bursting forth, but there is therefore now no condemnation. 
And he comes to the end of that seventh chapter, and, oh, wretched man that I am, who's going to deliver me from this body of death? To that ultimate dis- desperation to finally come into the eighth chapter and says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. How glorious that is, you know? How glorious that is. So here's the thing. If we are going to stand, we need to know where we stand, right? If we're going to stand, we need to know who we are in Jesus Christ. If we're going to stand, we need to know absolutely that we are complete in Him. And there is nothing that needs to be added to the finished work of Christ. We have to rest in that finished work. We have to know that nothing, as John tells us in in chapter 10, that nothing can separate us, nothing can take us out of the hands, sorry, of our Saviour, of our God. And more than just know it, Christian, because I think every one of us in this room knows that intellectually, don't we? Remember what that greatest of journeys is? I haven't said this for a while. The greatest of journeys that mankind will make is about 14 inches when that which we know is truth in our head becomes reality within our hearts. To get it from here to here. That's called resting. It's beyond just knowing. It's about resting in those things. We have to sit and we have to rest in him, knowing who we are in Christ. Then we can follow him. This is how the book is divided up. Then we can follow him and we can walk in the strength of the Holy Spirit in all holiness, just as God has created us for. See, here's the truth. And this is what I want you to understand today. Here's the truth. We cannot hope to enter into the battle victoriously if we are not resting in the security of the finished work of Jesus Christ. We cannot. And we cannot stand if our way of living, if our conduct is in conflict in the way that Christ would have us to live. As, as Watchman Nee, many of you know this book, in his little commentary on Ephesians, he says, first we sit, then we walk, and then we stand. Sit in what Christ has done for you. Walk in a life of holiness. And you what? Then you're ready for the battle. Then you're ready for the battle. So he says, finally, my brethren, after coming through all of this, this great journey and this great epistle, he says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. More literally, you see, we can read that and, and we can read it in a way where it depends upon me. Finally, be strong. But, but literally, it is be strengthened in the Lord. He's not saying you be strong. But rather, he's saying, let the strength of the Lord be strong in you. Let his might work in you. Let me tell you why. It's got to be him. There's a a very strange episode in Jude, uh, the ninth verse. And and, uh, there's a reference to something that we know nothing about. But there's a reference there uh, that obviously the the local they were talking about. And it's talking about this episode when the devil was contesting over the body of Moses. Remember God buried Moses secretly, didn't he? You know. And there's this episode there where God where the devil was contesting for his own reasons, over the body of Moses. And this is what it says. Let me just read it to you. And it says, Yet Michael, the archangel, that incredible, powerful, created being of God. Remember you and I? We have been created a little lower than the angels. Remember that? But here is Michael, that chief of angels, says, yet Michael the archangel, when he was contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. He did not bring any railing accusations against the devil, but he said, the Lord 
rebuke you. Just think about that, will you? Just think about that for a moment. Michael, the angel, would not directly himself rebuke the devil, but rather he would put the Lord between himself and the enemy. And we need to remember that. We need to remember we really are no match for the devil. Please understand that. He's an incredible spiritual being. You know, he's, he's not described as a lion and a dragon for no reason at all. Jesus didn't call him a thief who comes to steal and to kill and to destroy for no reason at all. No, no, no. He says, but we are told to be strengthened in the Lord and in the power of his might. Do you remember the seven sons of Sceva? What a, you know, we often laugh about that episode, don't we? You know, there in Acts chapter 19. We read this account. Let me just read it to you. It says, There were certain of the itinerant Jews. This is Acts 19, verse 13. There were certain of the itinerant Jews. They were exorcists. And it took upon themselves to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus. They took it upon themselves. They'd seen the power being manifest through the disciples in the name of Jesus. And they took it upon themselves to use that name. And it says, we adjure you. They said, we adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew and chief of the priests, which did also. Can you see it? Seven of them standing around this one poor demon-possessed individual. And standing over him and say, in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. What was the response of that demon inside that poor individual has answered him and said well Jesus I know Paul I know but who are you but who are you and the Bible tells us that the man in whom the demon was leaped upon them and overcame them and pounded them and tore their clothes off them they went running down the street naked probably vowing never to speak that name again I don't know. You see, they had no relationship, did they? In the Lord. It's not about me being strong, because I can't do anything. And it's the same for you. But it's us sitting, it's us resting, it's us walking in Christ who is strong. And it is he in us that enables us to stand against the enemy and bring the victory. I believe that the Christian who realizes, I believe this with all my heart, that the Christian who realizes that God does not want them to do anything by themselves has truly discovered the secret of the power and might of God in their lives. I truly believe that. It's not that God wants me to do anything in and of myself. But he wants to live. He wants to live his life in me and through me. Do you see the difference? Do you recognize the difference? One is me trying and the other is God in me. Nowhere. So here's the thing. Nowhere in the scripture are you told to try God. Nowhere. But everywhere it is Christ living in us. Again, it's the realization that I have no strength in myself to do anything for God, but I can do what is it tell us in Philippians 4:13, Jim? All things. How? How? Through Christ. Christ who does what? Christ who strengthens me. Again, I am strengthened in him. In fact, verse 10. Is, a, is, is an imperative continuous tense. And, and the idea is that moment by moment it is trusting, and it is moment by moment, it is trusting his strength to be transferred through you as you live your life in communion with him. See, we do ourselves a disservice when we think that we are building our strength up when we are becoming a reservoir for the strength of God to reside within us that we can exercise at any time. No, the Bible knows none of that. None of that. 
But it always speaks about the one who is in us. And so Paul would victoriously cry, it is no longer I that live, but Christ who lives in me. So finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Do you know what stand means? I've been saying it all morning, haven't I? We need to be able to stand. you know what stand means? It means hold your ground. That's what it means. In fact, the word stand, it means hold your ground against. It means don't be moved, right? I had in my mind last night, I was going to get you all up to stand up and do a little physical exercise with me. I was going to get you to face one another, plant your feet and start pushing each other. But I thought that might not be appropriate for all of us. But if you can get a mental image of that, a force pushing against you, but we who know who we are in Christ, we who understand the victory that Christ has won in and through our lives, we who are walking in holiness can stand and not be moved. It means don't be moved. You see, Christian, our warfare, please understand this, is not one of invading. We're not told to go invading anywhere. We're not told to march. Have you noticed that? It doesn't say march. It doesn't say, oh, you Christians, get all together. We've got lots of songs like that, haven't we? Old choruses like that. Here we are, marching off to war together, taking the ground. Well, you know, there's a sense of that. But in reality, biblically, we're told just to stand our ground. Why? Because we're told to hold the ground. What has Ephesians been all about? What God has done for us. We're told to hold the ground that God has given us. And we're going to see this in the next few weeks as we get into the, the, the armour that God has given us. Nearly all of that armour is defensive. Probably just the sword of the Spirit is the only offensive weapon that we've been given. Most of it is defensive to you to plant your feet. And stand upon the richness of the life that God has given you. And not to give any ground up. Here's the glorious truth that makes that so wonderful. The glorious truth is that Jesus Christ is the one that has won the war. This is what you've got to know. Jesus Christ has already done the invading, hasn't he? He has stormed the gates of hell, hasn't he? He's defeated the devil, hasn't he? He was the invader. He defeated Satan. He crushed the head of that old serpent 2,000 years ago. We fight. Here's the key. This is how we stand. We fight from victory. We don't fight for victory. Can I read Colossians again? What does Colossians tell us? That he, that is Jesus Christ, has disarmed principalities and powers. That he has made a public spectacle over them, triumphing over them. That's the cross. And again, all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me, Jesus would say. We stand in the victory that has already been won. Because we are conquerors. No, we're not conquerors, are we? We are what? That's right. We are more than conquerors. Through the Lord Jesus Christ. You stand, Christian, because you know who you are. Because you know the victory that's been won for you. You stand, Christian, because you are following a holy, righteous God. The bottom line is, Satan doesn't need to be defeated. No. He's already been defeated. He's already been defeated. And the only real power that he has is the power of a lie, you know. And man, he's good at that, isn't he? He's the accuser of the brethren, we're told. Man, he's so good at that. And you know just how powerful a lie can be if we allow it into our hearts and our minds, especially about God. It can be very powerful. But it's all he's got, Christian. 
Read 1 John chapter 5. Here's some of your homework. Go and read 1 John chapter 5 as well as read the entire book of Ephesians. Because it will tell you about where you stand and who and who cannot touch you, Christian. I'm not going to tell you. Please read 1 John chapter 5. Oh. Here's Satan's stratagems. If he can get you to believe that God is not with you, if he can get you to believe that God has abandoned you in any way, if he can get you to believe that God is not happy with you, that God has not accepted you, you know what you're doing? You're giving up ground. You're giving up ground that has been won for you, you know? And, and, and you're not fighting from victory. You're giving up the victory. But that's what the armor's all about. We, we, we'll get to look at that. I would have you to do one more thing for me this morning. I told you we wouldn't get far. I would have you to do one more thing for me. Can you, in your mind's eye, I know this is not a kosher thing, but can you picture a soldier clad in the armour of God? Remember when Paul wrote this? He was chained in an Ephesian prison, no, in a prison there, sorry. Where was he? He was... Um, I have to, check my, have to check myself. He was chained to a Roman soldier as he was writing these things. He was looking at this every single day. So can you imagine? Will you picture this with me? Can you see a soldier clad in armour? Can you see the, the, the helmet of salvation? Can you see the breastplate of righteousness? Can you see the belt of truth girding, holding everything together? Can you see the sword of the Spirit hanging from that belt? Can you see the shield of faith? Can you see the, 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 the feet that are clad? The Bible says they're in the, in the preparation of the gospel. We'll, we'll talk about that. But can you see that soldier clad in armour, standing, refusing to be moved? I want you to see that because that's who you are. You know what I don't want you to see? I don't want you to see a soldier not standing, but a soldier who has fallen to his knee, a soldier whose breastplate is hanging because the, the belt of truth has dropped from, the sword is laying on the ground next to him. The helmet is just dented and bruised. I don't want you to see that. Because that's not, that's not the image that Paul wants, is giving us. We fight from victory, right? You see, he wants you and I to see the soldier standing there, clad, victorious, in an impenetrable armour. Again, as we look at the armour, not one part of the body is uncovered. Yes, one. You know what, which part it is? Oh, sh yeah, it's the back. Because we don't turn... And we don't run. Why? Because we're victorious. Are you ready for this series? Okay. Okay. I'm going to invite the guys up and uh, we will um, finish in worship and praise. I think uh, the enemy hates that. When you praise God for his goodness and his faithfulness to you. Um, well, you need to understand, Christian, what the blood of Jesus Christ has done for you. You need to understand what the power of the Holy Spirit at work within your life actually is. You need to understand the power of the Word of God to change you, to transform you. You need to be strong. You need to stand. So we're going to talk about a lot of stuff over the coming weeks. And um, I believe it's going to be great. I believe it's going to be wonderful. Victory is yours. Thank you, Steve.
splendor of the King, clothed in majesty. Let all the earth rejoice, let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. Come on, church. How great. Great is our God. 